So I grew up allergic to chocolate. I didn't eat it. I didn't touch it as a kid. So literally until I was 20 years old and I was on a month long mountaineering, rock climbing, adventure, sleeping on glaciers, all the fun stuff, trip. At one of our base camps for some of the big mountain climbs, we got caught in a freak three-day snowstorm, lightning, and huge amounts of snow. And next thing you know, we're basically out of food and everything we need. So we're hiking out and eating mountain sorrel and different wild plants that you can get. We're cleaning out our packs, organizing all of our climbing gear. And my buddy finds at the bottom of his pack, a packet of brownie mix. So I'm super hungry and this smells really, really good. We ended up baking it over a fire. I took half of one. And man, I wish I had taken that whole because that half of a brownie in that moment, half starved after being in the wilderness for a month was one of the greatest things I had ever tasted in my entire life. And that was the first time that I had actually taken chocolate, anything chocolate, and willfully put it in my mouth and ate it. So I started making chocolate literally within days of first reaching the West Coast. Within a couple months of the first time ever trying chocolate. If you're not the expert in something, in Southern California, in LA, nobody will pay you even a second of mine. If you, if you want people to actually listen to what you have to say, you have to be the expert. So there's a lot of people who are chocolatiers and most of the chocolatiers on the planet are confectionery artists. So they're making confections, they're making desserts. A lot of times they don't have a direct connection with the plant itself. So they haven't worked with the cacao, Theobroma cacao, the tree, the ecosystem that it grows in. So craft chocolatiers tend to be working directly with cacao. They tend to be working directly with cacao suppliers and they tend to be paying attention to the different flavor notes and Ideally, with the more intentional companies, the exchange rate and the growing practices, the certified organic, the soil microbiology, the giving a equal exchange, something that is really beneficial to the farmers and the community. So a first really big project for me was called the Cloud Forest Conservation Initiative, and it was in central Guatemala. And this is this magical place with caves and waterfalls coming out of caves, huge ancient trees. I was alerted to the fact that right in the heart of the area that I cared the most about, somebody had cut eight acres, clear cut, to the ground. And that flipped the switch in me. So I made a little video, put my phone in front of my face, and I just said, I, I was like, I need help. We need to get together as a community and save this place. We created a, a campaign and first asked for $1,500. And within two months, I found myself in Guatemala with enough money to buy 444 acres. We got the interest of the Rainforest Alliance and the largest conservation nonprofit in Central America. And to date, we've raised somewhere over $7 million. We've protected all 10 square miles of the forest forever. And now we've created jobs with the local community in the conservation. Here we go. Episode number two. We brought Lenfesti from Commercial's Lifestyle, Mandela Chocolate, Mandela Springs, um, Wim Hof instructor, Yogi Slacker, uh, mountain climber, creative, all hack, musician. Yes, we finally made it. I have Rob here sitting on his veranda. Yeah, my porch at my house at Mandala Springs. I've got little little <laughs> yoga swing right here that I can play with. And, yeah, uh, I've got a slack line sitting right here as well that I can also play with. 
Yeah, just don't fall on the air. <laughs> oh, no, we're good. We got this. <laughs> yeah, for the people, we definitely want to save this video because you can see him <laughs> quite active. Uh, let's see. Now, how... can, can you hear me well when I'm all the way over here? Yeah, yeah. Now you're sitting in uh, a lotus pose on this slack line. Yeah. Jesus, I cannot even stand there when someone is holding my hand. <laughs> I look at him. Oh my God. Okay. People, this is my first, uh, second episode. Uh, and I warned you, I have so many questions for this man over there. That Hopefully uh, I have some answers. Oh, I'm sure you do. So let's see. Last time we talked a bit about your past, where you come from and, um, your awakenings and all the crazy stuff you're doing. And today's I was thinking of talking a bit about um, your chocolate. All right. Um, I'm always happy to talk about chocolate. I love chocolate. I mean, there's definitely a lot of things um, going into chocolate discussions. So, yeah. How, how did someone like you start having chocolate for sale? All right. This is going to... I. I it necessitates telling the the actual story in its in its full here. So um I'll I'll try to be concise with this, but uh it's actually pretty crazy. So I grew up allergic to chocolate. I didn't eat it, I didn't touch it uh as a kid. So literally until I was twenty years old and I was on a mountaineering adventure in the mountains of Wyoming here in the United States, a beautiful place called the Wind River Mountains. And uh, I was on a month long mountaineering, rock climbing adventure, sleeping on glaciers, all the fun stuff uh, cool. trip. And we had, we had actually stashed two weeks worth of food and fuel uh, at a certain point before dropping in. So we were able to stay out in the bush for an entire month. Uh, and long story short, at one of our base camps for some of the big mountain climbs, we got caught in a freak three-day snowstorm, lightning and, and huge amounts of snow. We went through all of our fuel and we went through tons of our food. And next thing you know, we're basically out of food. And we're out of uh, everything we need. So the last day or so, we're hiking out and eating mountain sorrel and different wild plants that you can get. And we get basically to the point where we're going to get picked up. So we're overlooking, we're finally overlooking this little dirt road where we're going to get picked up the next day. We're cleaning out our packs, organizing all of our climbing gear. And my buddy finds... At the bottom of his pack, hidden under all this climbing gear, packet of brownie mix. Now, I had kind of gotten an idea that I wasn't allergic to chocolate, uh, but I was still a little nervous. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm in, I can see the road, so I'm super hungry, and this smells really, really good. So uh, I ended up, uh, we ended up baking it over a fire, and I ended up taking a half of we only had these little tiny servings. I took half of one. And man, I wish I had taken that whole because that half of a brownie in that moment, half starved after being in the wilderness for a month was one of the greatest things I had ever tasted in my entire life. And that was the first time. Um, yeah, that was the first time that I had actually taken chocolate, anything chocolate, and willfully put it in my mouth and ate it. And it was pretty incredible. Uh, so that, that, was, that was how it began. Literally, I, I got picked up the next day. I was fine. No allergic reaction. So the, you were picked up a day later. So it was not the day you should have been picked up. It was, actually it was, it was the night before that first thing in the morning the next day. So I, I, I got to sleep on it. And uh, got picked up. They, we went to a gas station. And I ended up picking up like two of every single junk candy bar that I had been denied forever and just tried all of it. And I'm really lucky that 
that was basically as far as it went for me with the, you know, confectionery poison that people call chocolate in today's society. So I was basically on a walkabout living in my car and my journey took me to the West Coast for the first time ever. I had never seen the Pacific Ocean. I had never been to that side of the United States before. And I ended up very quickly finding myself amongst a group of raw superfood uh, affectionados. In fact, what it, it was, I mean, the way that I stumbled upon them was magic in and of itself. But what I didn't even realize is that I was actually amongst some of the top movers and shakers in the organic food world, uh, some of the originators of the raw foods movement. And I quickly found myself being paid to make eight ounce batches of raw organic superfood chocolate for a children's charity. And I would, and the only rule was that each batch had to be different. I had every superfood in existence in bulk to choose from. I had uh, uh, people there that were just a plethora of knowledge on the properties of all of these foods. And with my degree in agroecology and my study of wild plants and wild foods, it just fit perfectly. Like I, I, I was able to, to jive on the science and the properties and the way that they all work together pretty quickly. So I started making chocolate uh, literally within days of first reaching the West Coast within a couple months of the first time ever trying chocolate. So flash forward probably about six months and I am traveling with a friend to Southern California, Los Angeles. First time ever in my life. This friend is, is in that raw foods community. So I was very lucky that my first moment in LA, I was immediately amongst high functioning, super yogis, raw foodists, people doing different biohacking practices. This was all very early on in even this terminology before a lot of these things were known outside of a very small, very obscure group of, of crazy people. What, when was that like timeframe? 2000, 2005, 10? It was 2007. Oh. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, so that's a pre-Tim Ferris. <laughs> exactly. Yep. It was 2007. Uh, it's pre, uh, uh, a lot like pre Dave Asprey and Bulletproof Coffee and yeah, exactly. all of those things. But Dave Asprey was there. Uh, there was, you know, a couple raw restaurants. The raw food movement was really starting to hit its stride at that moment. And I found myself amongst a lot of the key players in this just automatically. So I was staying at a mansion of, of a friend, Steve, and uh, he would use this as a venue for transformational events, workshops. Uh, and this one particular day, there was going to be a chocolate making and Chinese herbal elixir workshop, followed by an all night ecstatic dance party fueled by chocolate and Chinese herbal elixirs. Perfect. And, and so the, the woman who was organizing this, she comes in to the, to the mansion. She's all flustered. She's all frustrated. She's like, what's going on? Hi. <laughs> and, she's, and she's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. The workshop's in a few hours. My chocolatier has bailed on me. He's not coming. I, we've got people coming soon. He was supposed to make a few... Raw dress. I'm, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, well, I was just in Northern California making raw pies and making raw pies and making raw chocolate. Like, I could probably do it for you. And she's like, great, that'll work. Let's do it. So I made her two raw pies and people showed up. I ended up teaching a workshop on chocolate making. And it went great. Had the dance party, everybody had a blast. And she turns to me and she's like, well, you know what? I've got like 15 of these scheduled all over Southern California. And if you want the gig, you can have it. Um, and so I, I left out a little part of this story. When she 
when she introduced me, she said, I'd like to introduce you to our cacao expert. He's got like 15 years of experience. He's done this and that. She lied. She totally made up a bunch of credentials that didn't exist. I had never experienced that before. Coming from, there's a very big cultural difference between kind of the East Coast mentality and the South where I'm from is like, and then Southern California. It's like, I'm, I wasn't used to that hustle kind of vibe. And, and she straight up just created credentials. So afterwards, I'm like, yeah, I'll do these other ones, but you, you can't make up credentials about me that doesn't work like you can't lie to people about my background she's like listen it's like if you're not the expert in something in southern california in la nobody will pay you even a second of mine like if you if you want people to actually listen to what you have to say you have to be the expert I'm like well i'll do the best i can but you can't really lie and she just kind of laughed so the next few ones came and she just exaggerated. She made it even more like insane. And I'd get all flustered and I'd get all my cheeks would turn red and I'd just not know what to do. And by the third one, I was like, listen, why? Like, these are going great. I don't think you need to like do that. And she's like, listen, like, if you're not, if you don't feel like you're that, then you better become it quick. So. I took her seriously. And and to this day, I, I don't know if she if she saw something in me or if she kind of helped to push it. But uh I directly went from there to Southern California. I went to Costa Rica and I worked on a 350-acre permaculture farm working directly with cacao and working directly with the superfoods. Um, I went from there, I worked and lived at the Hawaiian Agricultural Research Center with David Wolf and worked on a lot of other, uh, like actual science around, uh, cacao, growing cacao, different composting systems and soil microbiology systems that allowed you to get higher yields and create the natural immune resistance to the blight that cacao suffers from. And without ever deciding within months, literally think that months before I'm being carted around Southern California as a quote unquote expert on this was the first time I tried chocolate in my life. So it literally went from zero to 60. It, if there is ever a sense that a plant could choose you as a, as a, uh, liaison of its of of its properties and and sharing it with the world uh cacao did that with me so i never once chose to be a chocolatier and to be that but it happened and it became a huge part of my life and here i am however many years later uh and yeah I've, I've become all the credentials that she gave me all those years ago. Wow. Uh, again, a hundred million questions on my part. And sorry, if my daughter comes in again. It, it must be your wife. Whenever you talk to me, my daughter is very attached to me. It's funny. No <laughs> other interview that happens. Besides also about my technical problems. <laughs> I love children and I, I have, I, I have a great time with kids yeah i saw someone uh passing before in the white shirt not too yep. tall probably four five yep. years of age six 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 okay my son is quite tall for his age so. <laughs> no i mean wow so you were cho how do you call that chocolatier is that chocolatier uh, that's yeah. an expert like you know what kind of cacao beans grow where and how to there's, and so there's a lot of people, so there's a lot of people who are chocolatiers and most of the chocolatiers on the planet are confectionery artists. So they're making confections, they're making desserts. Um, a lot of times they don't have a direct connection with the plant itself. So they haven't worked with the cacao, theobroma cacao, the tree, uh, the ecosystem that it grows in the 
the soils, the fruits, the fermentation and the harvesting, there is the people, the indigenous people that live in the areas where cacao is from and where it grows. Uh, you know, they just basically get their their processed cacao mass, cocoa mass is what they call it. And they, you know, then they do the other processes that I do with the chocolate, which is the, you know, some sort of conking and grinding and then the tempering and putting it into bars. There's a lot of processes, but a big difference, and you're seeing more and more of this in what is considered the craft chocolate industry. So craft chocolatiers tend to be working directly with cacao. They tend to be working directly with cacao suppliers and they tend to be paying attention to the different flavor notes and ideally with the more intentional companies, the exchange rate and the grow the growing practices, you know, the certified organic, the soil microbiology, the giving a equal exchange, something that is really beneficial to the farmers and the community. Uh, but you start, you're starting to see more and more of that becoming more of a phenomenon. And so what's fun for me is I've been a part of it kind of, you know, when it, I'm, 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 I'm one of the early adopters in that regard, as far as really uh, focusing on the quality, um, not just in terms of the quality of the bean, but the quality of the people that are growing it, their quality of life, um, and the quality of all of the processing that goes into it. You know, I'm starting with whole cacao beans, and I am then turning that into the chocolate. And and something that I'm an early adopter of and, and fairly unique, actually, in the world is then the not just combining the cacao with these other powerful adaptogenic superfoods and medicines, including these very special ones that I harvest right here at Mandala Springs, right here on this property and in the national forest surrounding this property. Um, having created a, a program, this was crazy. It was a bureaucratic nightmare, but basically creating a program that allows for certified organic harvesting of wild herbs and mushrooms on public lands. And in order for me to do it, I had to actually help pioneer a national program so anyone can do it. And what this does is it ensures that the harvesting practices that we engage in support and create larger communities of the plants and mushrooms that we're harvesting and simultaneously add a layer of protection for the existing hardwood forest, the climax forest, uh, which is necessary to sustain the perennial herbs and mushrooms that we are using in the chocolate. So that was a really cool secondary effect was it actually created an entire new layer of, of protection for the forest because in order for this industry to exist, the intact forest needs to exist. And, and I guess that ties into a lot of the work that I did in Guatemala, a lot of the work that I'm doing here. I, I, I helped to, uh, I created a campaign that led to the protection of a 10 square mile mountain cloud forest, like a, a mountain rainforest in Guatemala, uh, working with the local Guatemalan farmers. He hearing about a few acres of that forest being cut and uh, asking my community for help, yes? So basically part of creating an intentional chocolate company and in the sense that I, in, in really caring about the sourcing and the people is conservation. You know, a lot of all of the superfoods that I use are the are perennial are the perennial organisms that thrive in a climax ecosystem. So an ecosystem where the forest is in its like primeval intact form. And so a huge part of my mission in life 
is protecting primeval ecosystems, protecting ancient forests and protecting places that are in the process of returning to that state. So a first really big project for me was called the Cloud Forest Conservation Initiative. And it was in central Guatemala. And this is this magical place with caves and waterfalls coming out of caves, huge ancient trees. And it was completely unknown to the Western world up until a few years ago. And me and some friends got to really spend some time exploring that forest and fell in love with it. I mean, it's rugged. We are putting ropes up in the trees and dropping down into caves with ropes, lots of rope systems. There's places where waterfalls come out of the sides of cliff bases. I took a lot of photos. If you go to um, forestprimeval.org and you look at that website, um, most of the photos that you'll see on that website, I took with my camera, especially when you see the pictures of the waterfalls and, and things like that. But we fell in love with this forest, but also the community around it. And, and we realized that this community actually owned this forest and were eager to sell it because they were desperate for money. And at the same time, some um, Spanish furniture makers yes. also discovered this forest and they were super ready to come in there, buy these parcels off of the community and make furniture, like clear cut. So I was oh. alerted. I was alerted to the fact that right in the heart of the area that I cared the most about, somebody had cut eight acres, clear cut to the ground. And we had aerial photos of it. And, and my buddy who started this project, Phil Tenemoto, sent this. He's like, I have some bad news for you. Like, this, we have this aerial photo showing this eight acres just got clear cut right on, like, right in the heart of this place. And that flipped the switch in me. And I was in tears. I was enraged. I was so upset. And so I made a little video, put my phone in front of my face. And I just said, I, I was like, I need help. Like, I've got this whole network all around the world of friends and allies and influencers. Like, I need help. And it was pretty raw and vulnerable, so I didn't share it at first. But then I posted on Facebook just words saying, listen, I don't, know, I don't care what it takes. We need to get together as a community and save this place. And, uh, and immediately, two friends came over to my place. And they, these two guys, it was amazing. They're just like, all right, we're in. What can we do to help? And I'm like, I don't know. It's like, we, I think we need to create a campaign because I think what we need to do is start purchasing these under our conservation nonprofit so we can protect them. And then I showed them my little video and me in tears. And they're like, you know, we need to make a crowdfunding campaign and we need to post that video to it immediately. So they convinced me to. I probably wouldn't have shared it because it was a little more vulnerable than anything I'd ever put up on the internet before. But we created a, a campaign and first asked for $1,500. To give you context, for about between $15,000 to $17,000, you could buy um, 111 acres of this. So very, very inexpensive for huge chunks. Um, so I asked for just a fraction of that. And within two months, I found myself in Guatemala with enough money to buy 444 acres of it. A year later, this conservation project. So once we reached the hundred thousand dollar mark, we got the interest of the Rainforest Alliance and the largest conservation nonprofit in Central America. And suddenly, within a year, we had raised $1.2 million. And to date, we've raised somewhere over $7 million. We've protected all 10 square miles of the forest forever. And now we've created jobs with the local community in the conservation. And... Uh, that is an ongoing project that, yeah, the forest is saved. And now it's working with the local community to ensure that their economic needs are met. And, and the thing is, is they would have made money from the sale of the forest, but it would have been temporary. Then this beautiful resource would have been gone. 
And the way those cloud forests work is, is they sit on top of the mountain. They comb moisture from the atmosphere and they then create all of the weather patterns and all of the moisture for the surrounding land. And you can see all over Central America where the cloud forest on top of the mountain has been stripped away and everything turns into a dry desert for hundreds of miles around. So that was what they were threatened with. And they didn't even realize they would have sold it. They would have made us a little bit of money. Then their forest would have been cut. All of their land would have turned into desert. It would have been a devastation for the people and for the ecosystem forever. So now our goal is to help them to create more economy, ecotourism, permaculture, um, helping create avenues for them to sell their agricultural products so that they're able to be abundant and their children and their children's children for generations to come. And that's honestly what the world needs right now everywhere. We need to replace these temporary, I'm going to get mine get mine now and screw future generations kind of mentality that has existed for so long. We need to be actively looking to create financial and resource abundance through systems that support future generations. It's the only way for humanity to move forward. It is the only intelligent path for the existence of business. And uh, so when I created Mandala Chocolate, uh, that principle lies at the absolute foundation of everything that I do. It's got to support the people. It's got to support the environment. And it has to do so in a way that is creating structures of sustainability for future generations. It, as the company grows, it must become a better steward of those principles. So um, a lot of companies, you know, start with a really good mission. They start with a really good value system. Then they start getting bigger and bigger. There becomes more of a corporate vibe and there's more people and investors and all sorts of things involved. And they start to lose the mission because that whole profit uh, bottom line begins to dominate. And profit is absolutely important. Um, that's the resource that then gets recycled back into this. But if that is the bottom line by itself, then, then the mission fails and, and it becomes a part of that same capitalist engine that has just the scarcity mentality that has just sucked so many places dry and so many people dry of resources. So that's why... Um, very early on, I knew we needed to become a certified B Corp, the benefit corp. And we went through this whole process to become a B Corp. And that involved putting a lot of legal language into the organizational documents for the company. And that establishes a triple bottom line. So profit has to be met with sustainability for communities and for the environment. And that has to exist forever. No matter how big this company gets, that has to be the core. And for me, I've I spent a huge part of my life living, you know, as a nomad out of the backpack, in the woods, out of the back of my car. Like, what is the reason for me to and to create more resources? Well, to, you know, I was able to comfortably live out of a backpack and comfortably able to live out of, a, out of my car and as a nomad. So what is the reason to create a business like this, to create a space like this? And it is to, it is to build structures that are a li living, breathing legacy uh, for future generations. That is the mission. That's the objective. That's the reason to build a business uh, out of the chocolate company. And so the idea is to hit every single level. So it's like, you know, you look at my life and what I do and, you know, between the physical practices like the slack line and the music and the chocolate and 
the conservation and the all of it, it's because I see the importance, and that's the convergence lifestyle. I see the importance of creating that holistic circle where you are embodying as as holistic of of the you know as holistically the different opportunities of human empowerment that you possibly can and sensitivity understanding and and communication with the natural environment like informing our behavior by the way the natural systems operate uh stuff that seems so blatant and so obvious and yet is so rare and ironically cutting edge in today's world. So that is what mandala chocolate is predicated on. And so I, I touched into the environmental conservation piece. That's really important. We give 10% of our profits to environmental conservation. And we choose those projects relative to what needs it at a time. So I have that cloud forest bar. Originally, I was giving 100% of that to the Cloud Forest Conservation Initiative, but now that doesn't need funding anymore. So our focus is elsewhere. So instead of that, we've just done 10% now of everything. And we're focusing on projects that need it. Right now, uh, just by chance, the biggest threat is to the national forest around us right now. There's a forest service plan where they are intending on designating a lot of acreage for clear cutting. They don't call it clear cutting, but it's really the way that it works. The companies come in and clear cut, they get fined and they pay you the fines, but the fines are the fines are less than the money they make from just clear cutting. So it's this it's this this it's this destructive system. And so we're working right now, and I'm the campaign director for something called um iHeartCraggy. iHeartCraggy.org. Um and it is a, and this is Craggy Mountain Wilderness. And our goal is to create the 13th National Wildlife Scenic Area in the United States, right here in this part of the National Forest. And we're going to protect it so that uh, all of the recreational use, my wildcrafting, everything is protected, but none of these trees can ever be cut. It will never be a part of the forestry program that involves logging. And we will protect this forest forever. So that is something we are actively working on right now. We're in the middle of the commentary period where public can reach out and, and, and say, hey, we think this needs to be protected in this way. And we feel very strongly that we are destined for that happening and that's something that happens in congress at the national level they vote on it and will designate it so i'm that's my active project right now so that's where that resource is going it's exciting because it's it's for this place and it's also probably the single most important large-scale ecological conservation project in the united states right now just so happens to be in my backyard is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Well, okay. Um, I don't know where to start. You you opened so many fault lines again. <laughs> it's it's crazy. That's, I mean, that's, that's I how we do. That's I don't want to interrupt you, but there's some. You know, you you you've got to touch into. Let's see. That's the last note to have because otherwise I'm lost. Uh, culture, business culture, sustainability, how businesses are made, and you know. You have your values and you start a business and so many get lost uh, over time, right? They start with two or three guys and like, hey, let's do this, let's do a super cool shoe. And then uh, suddenly they have 2,000 employees and or 10,000 employees. And now it's not so sustainable anymore as it was in the beginning. Where do you see problems? What do you think is the biggest problem when someone comes with really from his heart, has a really good project? creating shoes out of natural resources, protecting the people around and giving them jobs whatsoever, whatsoever, so on. And then suddenly it's another big corporation which is lying again, or it has its value and um, mission, vision statement, but they're not really living according to it. It's basically a nice poster and 
pictures on LinkedIn, Facebook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you leave a yeah. company, you don't feel it, right? You go to that company because you're like, oh, this is sustainable, but you realize, ah, it's just a magazine, right? Google is such a great example. They started with such an amazing core value, uh, like really sustainable, really uh, employee-driven, like people-driven company. And, and, and at the core of their motto was do no evil. And they literally, I mean, this is insane. They literally took the words do no evil out no. of their core philosophy. Think about being the guy or think about being in the business meeting like, so, you know, we got to kind of like take out the do no evil from our, from our like foundational verbiage. Like they literally removed that. I mean, to, the, to reach a point as a business where you're removing those words from your core philosophy and you don't see some really, really big problem. That's, you know, and that's, and this is one of the biggest companies in the world. So, you know, it, I think a lot of it is when you become a public traded company and suddenly you get these investors involved in the business that their only concern is profit. Um, they didn't get into it because they agreed with the values they saw that the values were working in terms of producing profit. And, and suddenly you get, you know, a board and a chamber and, you know, you get like chairman of the board and you have board members and voting bodies. And suddenly there's layers of management. And if you're not really careful and you're not vigilant from the very beginning, um, it is, it is really easy for it to get lost. It's really easy for those people that held that original vision to literally lose their capacity to maintain that vision because suddenly that corporate board of directors has a significant amount of the power and they're able to direct and dictate the direction of the company. Um, a lot of people in the process of building an intentional company, get it to a certain point and then they get burnt out. And so they then, then sell it. And once again, you're, you're with that problem. So my goal is to address as many of the weaknesses. You know, I study big companies. I study where along the way did things start to fall apart? Where did the value system start to weaken at the seams? Uh, where do things, you know, where do the holes exist? And the answer, the, the honest truth of it is it's, there's no clear moment. Um, there's lots of things we can do. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to a lot uh, when the business gets big enough, really figuring out a model, a system. I'm really interested in employee ownership model. I think that's a wonderful way to make sure that the investment is coming from the people who are a part of the mission uh, or the cooperative model, something like that. Uh, at some point in the business, it's going to become necessary to implement something of that nature in order to ensure that, that the employees, the investors, and everyone involved are best in, in the corrective which is business as a force of good, business as a force of, of perpetual sustainability and for building systems that will support seven generations forward. Uh, super important, absolutely necessary. Uh, all business will have to have this model. Um, it, the, the choice is that or death, honestly. Like humanity requires it. The earth will be fine. The earth will go on. But for us to survive as a species, all business will have to prioritize this. And so the fact that this is a leading edge and cutting edge perspective and strategy is mystifying to me, honestly, because it doesn't require, you don't have to look too far outside of yourself 
to see the necessity of this kind of business model. And I think what it comes down to is uh, the more holistic and convergent a human being is, the more they're able to look at the periphery, able to look at the bigger picture and really not just see it, but feel it, smell it, taste it, know it. And, and when you see, feel, smell, taste, experience, and live the bigger picture of being a part of this bigger world, being a part of this bigger humanity, understanding that we are cells in a body of a planet, um, and it, it becomes impossible to, to live for, uh, for an individual's sustenance and sustainability. In fact, a lot of that, I feel like, is this existential fear of death, this lack, this sense of, I need to get mine, 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 you know, like, I need to accumulate as much as possible before I die. It's like, that's, that's just an outdated model and it's destructive. It's what's really, I mean, I don't think people are consciously aware of that, but I feel like that's what's happening because they've never, they've never had any sort of rite of passage or initiative experience that has helped them to get that emotional, spiritual maturity where they truly know themselves, like cellularly know themselves to be a part of a greater community, a larger ecosystem. And when you know yourself to be a part of that, it changes your values, it changes your goals, it changes your perspective. Like there, like any any personal accumulation that I engage in that is not directly supporting future generations feels hollow and meaningless. And so a lot of that accumulation that you see, you know, people trying to become millionaires and billionaires and building this big bank account and getting the yacht and the big house and whatever else, all, like from a, from a vantage point of really intimately knowing the natural world and being a part of it, all of that feels completely pointless. Like, if I'm going to accumulate resources, if I'm going to be a multi-billionaire, all of that billions is not going to exist in a bank account. It's going to exist in forest and watersheds and sustainable energy technology and, and things that will support, yeah, creating a living legacy, structures that will live beyond my small life and my small moment and support the growth of those values in future generations. Um, and, and having that power gives me an ability to move mountains, but I'm going to use that power to keep the mountains exactly where they are instead. So, yeah. Wow. That's a uh, short answer. <laughs> So I have another, I mean, now you, you touched to, um, I've been reading just a book for another, um, podcast I had, I'm not done. And he's talking about, you know, onboarding for new uh, employees up to school, mm -hmm. uh, what to expect. And he's really, really no bullshitting. And he also touches to, you know, value system, mission, vision. Um, and he's talking about purpose. If you put purpose in the center of an organization. Um, when you start around like meetings, talk about purpose, they will get a complete different dynamic compared to mission, vision, uh, yeah. value, because, you know, top management sits down and says, okay, our mission is and our vision is and our value is, but if they don't feel it and live it, then the employees won't feel it. Um, so you agree on this per if you have a purpose driven meeting and say, what is the purpose of our business? You think then uh, employees would be happier or would it be? catapulting businesses to be more sustainable or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that the, you can feel the enthusiasm, the drive and the focus of what I like, 
there is a passion, a palatable passion or a palpable passion behind the words that I'm speaking. It's, it's, it's so much more than a bunch of words. It is a physical day in and day out purpose. Um, it is a reason to wake up in the morning. It's a reason to get out of bed. It's a reason to go into the world and to do something. It's a reason to create a chocolate bar and to sell it. I mean, it, it's when you look at like the chocolate is such a, I mean, chocolate is such a great product to utilize as a way to drive purpose in this regard because. You look at most of the chocolate out there, it's this confectionery poison. You know, the first ingredient is sugar. The second ingredient is milk solids. That sugar is this nasty, processed, disgusting, oh. And then that milk is coming from abused animals that live miserable lives and are pumped full of hormones and antibiotics. And then the third ingredient is alkalized cocoa. Alkalized cocoa comes from mostly Africa and there are these massive cacao plantations and all this cacao is grown in these massive monocrops, dumping chemicals in to keep them alive. There's this fungal blight that they can't fight that turns, you look at the fruit, they get all black and mushy and nasty um, and they can't fight it, but they're still dumping fungicides and dumping stuff into it. They're it's not even fair trade. They are literally using slaves, child slaves. A huge part of that labor force is slave labor. Still, we're in 2020, and we are, as a planet and as humanity, still still dealing with slavery on a scale that would make most people shudder. And one of the best places to see that in action is the African cacao market. So you have, and they take this cacao, it's in these rotting fruit, but they have to use it because that's all they've got. So most people are eating chocolate that cacao is, you know, a tertiary ingredient, but it's also just like this nasty uh, slave labor driven. And, and I am a firm believer. I know that like, the world it's it's the there's the practical there's the practical nutritional and medicinal value of ingredients that you use but there is absolutely an energetic quality to to the foods that you eat and the people that are growing it their living situation the environment that it's coming from and the intention of the people in control of that resource all plays a big part in what you are eating. The more sensitive you become to these foods, the more tangible that is. Um, and so literally they take that cacao and then they put it in this caustic alkaline solution to strip it of all of the bitter compounds, the bitter flavors, but they're also stripping it of all of its nutritional value. So whatever nutritional value is left in this like, sad, blighted cacao. They've just completely stripped the rest of it out so they could get this flavor that people want in their milk chocolate. So literally, you take... Here's the thing. Cacao is one of the single most powerful plants. Uh, you got a little bit hacked. So you said you take this simple plant uh, you and take strip this... it from everything. Yeah. Uh, like to, to, to take this back to why this is so ironic yeah. is cacao theobroma cacao theobroma literally means theo god broma food it's literally the food of the gods that's the name that science has given it that's its taxonomy and and it was used as currency by ancient civilizations in central america they literally used cacao beans as their currency and when you look at the nutritional and, and nutraceutical properties of cacao, it is off the charts. When you look at a chart of antioxidants, you've got, you know, acai and blueberries and all of these things with antioxidants, and they're on this curve. 
And then cacao is way over here in its own category by itself. More antioxidants than anything else. Um, and it, and the field bromine. So most people think it's got caffeine in it, but it doesn't. It has this field bromine, which is this, whereas caffeine is a vasoconstrictor, it reduces blood flow. Field bromine is a vasodilator. It opens up all your blood vessels. It allows your body to get more oxygen. It allows your body to actually receive more nutrients. And, and so cacao is this incredible plant. So it's extra ironic. It, it, it's, it's almost laughable. It's almost like the plot of a bad movie, like a, like a B movie, low budget, poor writing, poor directorship. It is that kind of a story when you look at what the majority of chocolate is on the planet right now that people are consuming. You take one of the most powerful, beautiful, and abundant foods on the planet and you twist it into this confectionary poison that is destroying communities, perpetuating slavery, and then destroying the bodies of the end user, the person who's eating it. It's insane. But that's, once again, that's kind of what we're up against is this world that in, in a lot of ways, the cultural normative world feels like the plot of a B movie. It feels like too bad to be true. You know, the, the, the forces of bad versus good in this regard just seem overblown. But in a lot of, that's, that's the actual reality of the world that we're living in. Yes, so you got, you know, you see, I'm Swiss. That has so much of chocolate. I mean, I grew up with chocolate, but, um, uh, okay, I didn't know all these details, so thank you for that. So what do you think, and, and you, you mentioned it's mainly from Africa, not from South Africa, uh, South or America. Or Central America, yeah. Central America, the chocolate, uh, for, uh, for, Farming is in a better state than in Africa or? Yes. Uh, there's, uh, there are still areas of Central and South America where farmers are being exploited. Uh, there's, no, there's no known slavery happening like in Africa, but there's as good as slavery where the wages and what they're actually getting paid doesn't give them a choice to do anything else. Um, and I, I believe that fair trade, the actual fair trade uh, stamp is insufficient because a, a, you, a lot of fair trade wages still don't really give the farmer a choice. The farmer is still basically a slave of their reality. I think in order for an exchange to be truly fair, you have to be giving that farmer a livelihood that allows him to choose what he wants to do. And when he chooses growing cacao, that cacao that you get is going to be exponentially better than the cacao you get from a farmer who day in and day out is doing what he must, what he needs to, to survive. There's a, I mean, you cannot compare the energetics of those two states and, and you can see it, feel it and taste it in the product in the end product that you get. I mean, what did you just say? Yesterday, uh, I planned to do some creative work and something went wrong in my brain. And I lost the energy. And then I was cleaning up because we're going to change the floor in our basement. And I had such a low energy. I like, had to do it. And then I just completely got in the black mode. So I can imagine that's, that's how it is. Like you have to do it, you're not really loving it. And it's just like, ah, oh, it's cleaning again. And the kids are not helping. My wife is not helping. I don't want to do it. Of course, I had a choice there. And I should have slept for something like having a power nap, yeah. hot uh, black chocolate or something. Um, but I can definitely understand that. And isn't this kind of like many, many people? I just had a discussion with my wife. Why are companies not more thoughtful? And why are they not? you know, stopping to be corrupt. It's like, yeah, people know they are, you know, and uh, probably in a not so healthy company. I mean, I don't want to name uh, one big company from Switzerland in food, which is doing more than bad things, right? My wife said, yeah, but people don't have a choice. 
And, you know, looking at from a European point of view, we're not slaves. We can still move to another company. But if many, many companies have just mission, mission statements, which are just made to look good, and you go in the company, you realize it's not really what they say. And like, oh, I need the salary because I just bought my new car and I have <laughs> a rent to pay. And I want to go to vacation to Costa Rica to have whatever dancing music festivals. What, what is your take on that? Well, this has always been one of the biggest, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's a, it's death by a thousand cuts in a lot of ways. Um, it's, there's so many factors. I can only speak to a few that I think are very important. And, and, you know, they, that, that in and of itself is an entire conversation because it comes back to the whole, it comes back to the whole convergence piece. It comes back to the whole living life from a expanded holistic perspective where you are engaging in and, and expressing all of the different aspects of what a holistic, healthy, and empowered human being can do in life. You're at least keeping a balanced, not just perspective, but experiential lifestyle. And and I think one of the aspects of that that has been missing in any European culture, any Western culture for uh, potentially millennia uh, is a real, the, a real authentic rite of passage, um, especially for males. Uh, like when a coming of age rite of passage in nature with nature in connection the kind of rite of passage like you know going on a solo hunt for a week by yourself with no food and no water uh in the wilderness barefoot connected to the earth connected to the plants those experiences instill that understanding that visceral experience of interconnectivity so you get raised in your, you know, with, with your television and you go to school, you go to college, you get a job, you, you live in your house, you go to work, you come home, you watch TV that literally in our society, you can go an entire lifetime without ever spending more than a superficial amount of time in nature. And when I see people like normal people on a nature trail, they're all wearing these big fat shoes and they're moving in this big Western, like plodding sort of way, sending big shock waves of energy up their bodies. It's like from someone who teaches primitive walking and, and barefoot experience and, and the tactile awareness that you get from your feet. Imagine going through life all the sensitive nerve endings on your hands. It's like how much experience we get from touching the world. You have the same amount of nerve endings, the same kind of nerve endings in the bottoms of your feet. So imagine if your entire life, every time you went outside, you put on gloves that had big, thick rubber soles on them. And that's the, and, and they were stiff and they, they kept your fingers from moving the way they were supposed to. And the entire way that you experienced the outside world was always like that. That's what we do to our feet every day and yet how many people are out there walking barefoot in nature if you do that you're considered radical you're considered like on this like strange edge or you know outside of normal reality where for millions and millions of years for the entire evolution of our species normal reality was walking around in the natural world barefoot we lose so much benefit to our entire bodies from that one piece. So once again, these are all like what I am, you know, it's like I'm dancing around this set of principles that, that create a visceral embodied experience of connectivity to something bigger than yourself. And when you don't have that, then it's easier to be afraid of death. It's easier to be afraid 
um, because you don't have a sense of your place in the bigger thing. And, and that keeps people anxious. It keeps people distracted. They don't want to go deep. They don't want to have to think too deeply about these deeper philosophical things because there's a scared little child that never had an opportunity to go through the kinds of experiences that create an authentic, holistic, mental, spiritual, and emotional adult. So people go their entire lives in a state of mental, spiritual, and emotional adolescence. And that adolescence is the primary mover of a sick, destructive, resource depleting, uh, only thinking about ourselves, uh, not being able to really connect to the chain of of consequence to our consumption, to our actions, to our life. I mean, it's just easy to, it's just easy to stay in that distraction, you know, just be distracted by, I've got my family, I've got my life, I've got my work, and I've got whatever entertainment that I go into, I've got my hobbies, and I can spend every single day of my life in that and never have to really emotionally, spiritually, and mentally own or consider the real visceral consequences of my actions and my presence and the way I live my life as it's going to perpetuate into future generations. That is the core sickness that our society continues to perpetuate and i feel sorry for people because they're not exposed to this message in, in, in a way where and then and from this message therefore then the tools to make a difference they can go their entire lives surrounded by other people doing the same thing and never even realize the depth of what is missing and 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 it's not just understanding the consequence of our actions. When you have that awareness, suddenly it, it, it goes with the connection to the bigger picture, which then leads to the experience of what can only be described from a, you know, from a relativistic experiential place as the magic in life, the mystery the juice, the, the expansive anything is possibleness of life. The, that is absolutely core and foundational to being able to be an embodied superhuman who is capable of utterly badass stuff and able to change the world, move mountains, and make a tangible difference on this planet, it starts there. And that is what's missing. And so a big part of my work and, and the convergence lifestyle, it's like, what am I sharing? The chocolate, this like hyper nutritive powerhouse chocolate that is a whole food in and of itself, like bringing in these super herbs from around the world, creating this global international bridge of the most nutritious plants and mushrooms. And, 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 and celebrating and sharing this with the world, it's all a part of it. And, and my hope is that when somebody eats the chocolate, whether they know it or not, a, an, an essence of that piece that is missing, an essence of that magic, of that connectivity, of that feeling. I mean, the state of being, the mental, emotional, and spiritual experience of living that way is intoxicating it is the most it is it is so good i i wish it upon anyone like people don't even realize the distraction of of that daily life cycle it, it helps people to feel comfortable in a lesser form of what they are capable of 
And human beings are really special in our adaptability where something that would seem painful, miserable, and inconceivable can actually become comfortable. Like the body will numb itself to pain. It'll numb itself to having all that prefrontal ability shut down, numb itself to being in a fight or flight stress response day in and day out. And, and what's sad is people will get comfortably numb in that regard and won't even realize what they're missing. That's the biggest part is people, I, they'll hear my words, they'll, they'll experience my passion. But what I really want to do is I want to reach through this audio mic. I want to reach through this computer screen and I want to touch them. I want them to feel in their bodies what it feels like to know the names of the wild plants, to know what they feel like, to know the kinds of communities they organize themselves into, to know what it feels like to drink nothing but wild living water every day of your life, to eat wild food, to walk barefoot. What that does to the entire chain of, of muscles and connective tissues in your body, the way that it, that it informs your movement, the information and intelligence that your feet transfer. I mean, there's so many pieces. I could, I could, I could make that list and we could have uh, a couple of days of me just listing all of the aspects of that, but it's in the music, it's in the movement, it's in the chocolate, it's in the place, it's in the spirit. And that is the most important thing I can share with the world. I have speechless. Um, I told you already the first five minutes of our first interview, we're going to have many talks. I, I, I stopped taking any notes because I'm just taking questions. <laughs> because otherwise, I cannot ask all of you questions. Um, you know, I have I found five fingers from Beat Run like five six years ago because I didn't feel comfortable walking barefoot in the city. Because now I, I agree, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, I live across oops, a bigger city, and you know, people are throwing up, peeing on the sidewalk having whatever needles. I had a friend which was walking barefoot in the city and I couldn't understand it. It was too much for me. One thing you realize is you actually absorb a lot, like, and you're meant to, like from the natural soils and the natural environment, you absorb a lot through your feet and that's actually beneficial. But in the city, and I like, I refuse to walk barefoot in the city for the exact same reason, because you are absorbing and, and connecting yeah. with a lot of things that you don't want to in <laughs> public environments. So that's, that's completely valid. And I'm glad you brought that up because I, I feel the same way. Yeah. So for me, the, uh, my feet are deformed, like the little toe. Uh, I don't shoot. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm not so flexible anymore, I thought I can chew it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be very flexible. Um, but since I found the five fingers, I mean, I basically like 90, 95% of the time I have the five fingers on, uh, winter, summer in the water everywhere, because here in our, um, fjord, I was cutting my feet two or three times. Uh, I don't need to cut my feet on a shell or on a sharp stone just because I want to my feet. I also want to use my brain a little bit, right? But else I, I'm totally on use walking bare feet, uh, using your toes. I get so. I don't know the feeling, what, what the feeling is, if it's frustration, anger, disappointment. Um, when I see parents going to kindergarten or daycare and uh, they come in there, they run away bare feet and the parents say, oh, you have to come, you have to come, you have to take the shoes on, it's cold. I'm like, half of the kids are bare feet. And, 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 and the parents are really pushing this little kid into the, into the shoes because it's all, uh, and I'm like, let the kids. But I cannot because then I'm an extremist. Right? Extreme and let people be. Ironically, what, what is naturally, inherently normal um, relative to millions and millions of years of evolution is now extremist. Yes, exactly. Now kids running around naked. Hello. My wife as well. Like, don't walk around naked with the kids. I'm like, why? This is natural. 
Um, exactly how we were. <laughs> that's how we came into the world. And many cultures do that. So, um, yeah, that was my take on the five fingers of the vision. <laughs> because I'm, what, what, what I've also heard, I had really big problems uh, meditating four years ago. Now it's going better and better and better, right? I had help with Nada, acupuncture, right. and different ways. Uh, I heard people talking, if you can go barefoot in your garden, stand on grass in the forest, that will help you to kind of get, you know, like uh, synchronized with, with the natural um, currency, whatever, like positive, negative. The currents, yeah. So earthing. Earthing. It's yeah. called earthing. And you can measure. So when people walk around all day in rubber soles, uh, rubber is insulative. So it actually prevents you from connecting um, just on a pure electrical level with the planet. And we have all of these EMFs. We have all this electromagnetic radiation uh, surrounding us. You know, our, our appliances, our televisions, our cell phones, all of the Wi-Fi and everything. What that does is it slowly accumulates a charge. You can measure it with a multimeter. This is, this is not, this is very easy to see. People accumulate a charge. And there's a growing body of science that shows that that excess charge in the body is one of the primary uh, causes of a lot of inflammation and inflammatory disease. So uh, earthing, which is what you do in any electrical system, AC electric, you know, you've got your positive, your negative, and then you've got your ground, your, your neutral. And, and the process of creating a ground uh, for that alternating current is called earthing. So earthing yourself, grounding yourself is really important. The earth has a electromagnetic frequency that is maintained by lightning. Lightning is striking everywhere on the planet at all times. It's by the movement, by the magnetism, by the lightning. All of these things create this, this resonance that, that the earth, the frequency that the earth has. When we are, when we are out of sync with it it, it, it literally, to me, when I'm out of sync with it, so when I spend a lot of time in my house or I'm in a car, I go from my house to my car, I'm not earthed. Having, having spent so many years of my life creating a very intimate, like physiological understanding of what it feels like to be connected and to be completely in sync with the natural environment, it's that much more obvious to me when I have that excess charge. Because what that means is that means that my frequency and the Earth's frequency are out of sync with each other. They are dissonant. They are in conflict with each other. It's like everything is energy. All matter is energy. Everything is energy. So the principles that govern frequency govern everything. I mean, it's, that's, there's no, that, that's just basic science. That's basic physics at this point. So if you have two frequencies that are in conflict with each other, they create dissonance. They break themselves apart. You lose the power and the fidelity of the signal. And so one of the most important things we can do is find coherence. So where you are either in the same frequency as, or at least in a relative harmonic to that frequency. And this is where the music creates such a beautiful metaphor in this regard. But it's, it's like, you know, the music of my body, you know, the frequencies of my body, the frequencies of the, the earth, I want to keep them as coherent as possible at all times. That's going to directly lead to me being able to exert my greatest amount of creativity, um, the least amount of infl inflammation in my body. Uh, it'll keep me in the greatest amount of peace because that dissonance creates stress, creates stress response in the human body. So. One of the most important things I can do is to make sure that I am continually discharging that excess energy. Um, if you can't take your shoes off, uh, one of the like, so if you find a stream or anywhere where there's running water, you can instantly reset, 
your body. It's so quick. The, the discharge is so, and you can plug a multimeter to yourself and you can see this, that you can measure it. Um, putting your feet on the ground, it takes a little bit more time to discharge, but it discharges all the same. Another way you can, if you don't have that and you don't have the ability to take your shoes off, is you can actually hug a tree. Hugging that's a tree. Where, that's where the tree hug comes from. It, it will literally, it's, it's a slower discharge as well. Um, unless the tree is wet, that actually helps. Water helps the process. But and if you have, fire, if you have lightning. Well, that will, that'll, that'll, that'll add a different charge to everything for sure. That might, you know, I'm, I'm like, if I ever get hit by lightning, like, you know, hopefully all the work I've done in, in creating that coherence in my body, um, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for superpowers. Nothing less. You just opened another question here. Um, uh, I, I wanted to go back to chocolate eventually. Before I go back to chocolate, um, I write all the other questions for the next episode. And because I am... So it goes. Then we go in, in another field a bit. Um, what is your theory now that it just touched lightning and, you know, be, you say earth or grounded? I mean, there's a difference. Uh, which you can also go, but I don't take it for this one. Next episode, we're going to grounding in different ways, right? Uh, body, mind, heart, uh, physical, everything. People survive being hit by lightning. Others don't. You now you just touched that you hope to be a superhuman by all the work you do. What is your theory? Why do some people survive? And like uh, I, I just touched on it. I believe people who survive lightning strikes um, are probably, this is completely anecdotal and, and this is coming completely just from me piecing things together in this moment. But I would believe that if you looked at their bodies, um, because slowly over time as your body is forming and reforming itself over the years, the the more time you spend in a state of coherence, so your earth, you're coherent, you're in sync with the natural frequency of the planet. I mean, in all of the esoteric terms, but in just the practical electrical terms as well, the way your body forms and all your tissues organize themselves and the way that everything is created in your body will reflect that coherence. It has to. And so I believe that if your body has sufficient coherence, that if you, for example, get struck by lightning, um, your body, it's going to hit a harmonic frequency. So it's going to empower and enliven potentially. Whereas if your body is out of sync with the natural world and you get struck by lightning, all of a sudden, dissonance is created. That frequency, that electricity, that electrical impulse and, 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 and frequency will create dissonance instead of coherence. And that dissonance with that extreme of a frequency will probably just destroy. You know, it'll, it'll literally destroy tissues and destroy your body. Uh, that would be, I mean... And, and that's putting it in a very crude way um, certainly is not, it, it, it doesn't stand up to, to the peer-reviewed scientific uh, process, but this is how we get to peer-reviewed science. You take what you know about the world and what you know about existing peer-reviewed science, and then you make up, you postulate. You say, this is, what I, this is what I believe to be the truth. And then you figure out a way to study it. I'm sure there's a way we could create a university study where we look at living tissue and we, and we put different like charges through it at different frequencies and see how frequencies that are coherent to the organizational structure of that living tissue affect it versus that are dissonant to the organizational structure of those tissues. I'm sure there is a way to create a, a very strong peer-reviewed study of this that would 
that would have some sort of conclusive result. Yeah, I hope they do that study in Europe or the US, not somewhere in China or Africa, because then we don't know what was the living tissue which was tested on. Good point. And sorry, but I couldn't help that one. So, uh, oh, um, yes, one question about the, um, which goes back to chocolate a bit. Uh, or cacao. It all comes back to chocolate. <laughs> yeah, my wife said, just ask him because you don't think, as a Swiss, I grew up with whatever Swiss chocolate, Toblerone, all these things. I cannot eat it anymore. I love white chocolate. If I eat it now, it's too sweet. It yeah, makes me feel It's confectionary weird. poison. It makes me weird. I eat the 85, 90, 95% chocolate if I can. And I'm so far, so far, the, the one chocolate which stayed with me is limited. I don't know how their uh, work is and you know how healthy and whatever their business is. It's just the one I found just the lowest amount of sugar, at least on paper. And the, for me, it looks the best I found so far, which I can, uh, which I can eat. Um, not that it's necessarily best uh, consciously, and I have to admit. But when we look at food as medicine, I don't know where to start here because it touched to so many points. Um, the whole energy goes into creating the food. I mean, you, you really nicely touched it. Milk chop, the cows, I mean, I guess in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they were probably a little bit less poisoned by keeping them alive. Well, and then also, like, was that cacao alkalized? So was it yeah. then stripped of its nutrients? What kind of sugar are you using? Is it more of a complex, mineralized, natural sugar? Or is it this white confectionery chemical poison? These things are, these are huge questions and they make all the difference. So I, I can step up, see, because you touched the energy and you said now it's a confectionery, like highly processed sugar. Is it highly processed milk? Is from cows which are living in a small little place. They don't really have much green to get out. They're just pumped, uh, pumped up with drugs to stay alive, to produce what they should. Are the people willingly plugging and process? I mean, it's, it, I guess many people which will listen to that, they will going to be, uh, really seriously, is there any difference if someone is happy or not happy while they're cleaning the fruits or sorting the goods from the bag? I mean, some people say there is. You, you can feel it afterwards, as you said. Taste is different. I mean, my, my entire lifestyle, and like, this kind of goes into a thing where for me, belief in anything is earned. I don't believe anything that isn't earned through my experience. And when it comes to the energetic quality of, of foods that are grown, process and treated with love and respect versus foods that aren't that concept has earned my experiential belief tenfold hundredfold time and time again it is like when as you you know as you advance in the lifestyle you become more sensitive you you become a lot more sensitive i can't drink tap water like I can feel the way it moves through my body. It's, it's, it's nasty stuff. It's horrible. And likewise, like if I were to eat chocolate, that is, you know, this lowest common denominator, you know, it's, it's the pure profit driven. Let's get the maximum out of the world, out of people, out of the environment for the minimum amount of input. Um, that whole mentality, you can feel it. It's, Oh, it's dense. It feels like density. That's the best way I can, it, uh, I, I can feel it in my temples. Like I, I've felt it in things that claimed to be intentional and, and I tasted it because the packaging and the branding gave a certain impression. And I realized that it was BS, that it wasn't doing that. And then, you know, that always will put me into a research, uh, Thing and I'll I'll dive deeper and I'll realize yeah this company's not walking the walk they're a, you know so it's a mission and mission statement it's a nice brochure which is just showing like bling bling behind brochure is nothing exactly it's a mission statement versus a true purpose and 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 so that's 
and it's the kind of world I'm, that I want to create. You know, it's like, I want to see humans walking that walk. Like that's what will, that is what will serve future generations. That is the world we want to live in. You want to wake up every day in a world that the air is clean and the water is clean and the forests are old and all of the wild foods and medicines are, are available and easy to eat. That's, that's the world we want. We don't want to wake up into an industrial wasteland. It seems obvious, but the day-to-day lifestyle steps that it takes to do so is what has been inherently missing from normative society. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that is the essence of, of what I'm trying to do and what this growing, like, excitedly, exponentially growing community of people around us are creating right now. So if I touch to two questions, one was uh, coming up while you're talking is when you're out of sync, when you feel like your body didn't connect with the earth, so not grounded. How does that feel? And is that the same when we eat processed food, which was not created by, you know, harmony and love? Yes, it's, it's, um, they are, they are very similar. Uh, the electrical feeling is a little different. It feels, um, well, it's more acute right off the bat. Um, you could feel it, it actually creates stiffness and inflammation. Um, you could feel it as almost like it, it feels kind of like anxiety. It's a very anxious feeling for me. And, and it also, I can, it's like my senses. I have a, a reduction in the clarity and the depth of my sensory experience of the world when I am out of sync and I am disconnected. Like the sharpness, the sense of connection. Like if I'm really out of sync, I look at a tree and it's like, hard for me to connect to the spirit of it like it, it's just a tree sitting there it still looks pretty but when i am like days and weeks deep in in deep connection um there's an entire dialogue happening there is an entire transference of intelligence and connection and whether that's something that i am purely experiencing inside of myself or or the reality that i believe it to be and know it to be doesn't matter because the feeling and the experience of it is invigorating. It makes me feel alive, happy, and healthy. And really, what's actually going on in the science of it and the spirit of it, and whether it's esoteric, this or that, actually is completely doesn't matter because what matters is I feel alive, I have less inflammation. I'm able to move better. I am able to be more present. I'm able to be more creative. I'm able to focus longer and work harder and get more things done. So the food and the water, like that eating processed food and, and nasty water and th things like that, it, 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 it follows a similar thing, but it becomes, it's even more inherent. Like your body is literally becoming that. Like you're physically using that to create your cells and to create your body. So it, it has a deeper resonance that requires more time and energy to break down and unlock. Um, and if you're already in a pure state and you're eating the healthiest food and the best, drinking the best water, it's all wild and alive and full of that life force energy. If you eat like, you know, one candy bar or something processed, you'll feel it. It'll be disgusting, but you'll process it through more easily. You know, it's that death by a thousand cuts. It's a process of attrition and every little micro decision that we make, you know, that one little bit of processed food here or bad water there, it all adds up. But simultaneously on the other end, the positive end, Every day that we walk outside and be barefoot and connect with it and eat wild food and drink wild water and, and meditate and do the Wim Hof method, do the breath work and expand, eat healthy chocolate, vasodilation, all of these things. Likewise, every little micro decision 
will will go into our lives and it will it will build on itself it, it's 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 a upward spiral instead of a downward spiral we have been through this medicine and uh, your your talk about the feeling i was just thinking yesterday i really lost myself and then i said i was too much in the house when, when you're electrically not in sync with with nature do you have like this numbness this brain fault where you just somehow everything is difficult you cannot really think also today i was sitting too much inside the house uh, preparing the last day and into had too much text i used three four hours and i wasn't really out and then i talked to my wife and i somehow had such a slow head uh, yes um Absolutely. I mean, you, you just nailed it. Um, it's fog. Fog, I mean, the way I was describing my vis- you know, the visual representation of the tree, it's a fog. It's, it's a layer of density over, over the maximum functioning of my brain and the maximum functioning of my senses and the maximum functioning of my body. So, you know, if I'm in that space, I, 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 I stiffer, I'm, yeah. Less agile, less mobile. Um, I am more sluggish, um, and like I said, my my sensory awareness of the world around me, my access to creative, like to creative expression, my general energy, and my efficaciousness in anything that I apply myself to, all of that is diminished, and. I believe that most people in Western world live day in and day out in this state of diminishment. And it's so normal to them. And it's such a normal state of being that they have absolutely no idea that something else is available. And part of that is, is like, you know, it's such a process of, of what would be the opposite of death by a thousand cuts. It would be life by a thousand little micro actions that support health and well-being and and so you know they'll try they'll they'll do a fast or they'll try meditation or they'll do this and that and they'll get some benefit but it doesn't last uh, they don't realize that it's really this it's it's an exponential process that all these little itty bitty things you do every minute of every day will add up to this level of empowerment. And when you get there over time, your when your body, for example, has more coherence built into it, you know, I can spend a few days in the middle of a city or on the road eating food that is not my best food and being ungrounded from the earth. But my body's able to split back into it more easily. Because it knows the difference. Um, yes. And 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 that's the big that's the big gift of doing all the micro things more consistently and regularly. Whereas if you're just getting into it, it's gonna be the opposite end. It's gonna kind of feel like pushing a boulder uphill uphill at first. You know, the process of attrition. It'll be easier to sink back into the fog. Um, it'll take more time for the body to come into a state of coherence. Um, but it's when you when you really when the association is there in the mind and body, like that mental mind body connection, where you are associating healthy practices with this sense of invigoration and the sense of awakeness and the sense of of sensory acuity, um, the more you can create that association, the easier it is to find yourself craving the behaviors that breathe. I asked you because often I'm looked at this crazy person because I can feel the difference. Uh, come on, don't. It's just one day inside and I'm getting like an asshole. Um, at least that's how I feel. And instead of letting the kids play, I start to compli- complain 
why don't we do this? And didn't we agree? And it's just because I did not go out. I didn't go on the trampoline in the morning, jump on get fresh air, go for a walk, have the feet on the grass. I mean, even when I work around, what was that? Even when I work around the house and to put stone, the stone path or the I'm bare feet. Yep. Until I have to use a shovel because I don't really want to stamp bare feet on the shovel and press hard with uh, earth. But I can feel it. And I'm, I don't have the feeling I'm where you are. I'm somewhere, you know, I don't know if I'm at 20% or 50% or 60%, but I can feel when I'm just too long inside. Um, so I can totally understand. So, but going back as food as medicine. Now, let's say you, you mentioned also like death by thousands of cuts and a lot of little habits and things you do and think and eat. Now people eat that chocolate, eat that processed food, and they don't feel a difference. How can they learn? What, what, could, what do you think they could do to learn what is good for them? And what is bad? Do you have any tips if they so- don't feel it? If they don't feel it. Yeah. And so if you, if you've been in a lifelong pattern of numbing these things, it's going to take a while for you to really be able to feel, um, the more subtle things like the difference between eating an organic banana and a conventional banana, you know, you're not going to feel that right away. If you're coming from a perspective of eating hostess cakes or uh, you know, Hershey's chocolate bars as a, as, as a normal experience. So a banana is a banana in, in that regard to someone in that state. So my bit, my best advice is honestly, uh, a practice like the Wim Hof method is actually literally one of the best ways that anyone can start to rapidly start getting that mind body connection through the vagus nerve rehabilitated, like reinstated and starting to uh, to experience what that intelligence and awareness is when your mind and body are actually communicating with each other on that level. Um, I find a lot of people who come to the Wim Hof Method uh, having very little experience in any of these things that we're speaking of um, more rapidly than any other strategy that I've ever seen or discovered are able to get to a place of sensitivity where they're able to perceive and feel the differences between the healthy behaviors and the destructive behaviors uh, with greater and greater acuity. So the the Wim Hof method, the breath work especially, uh, is I think one of the most one of the most accessible tools to start to understand the subtlety that we are speaking of. And once you start to understand it, if you act on that understanding and you start doing things that you know are healthier and better for you, you'll start to feel the result of doing things that are more understanding and feel better for you. When it comes to eating healthy food, you got to give yourself you know, give yourself months, choose to eat nothing but organic. doesn't matter what you're eating, but or just organic for a few months. See how you feel. Then try to go back, try to, try to suddenly backtrack to what you were eating before. You'll notice a difference. Okay? You, you won't, you know, you'll, you'll look at the food in front of you and be like, that looks dead and lifeless. It doesn't have the missing something. You might not be able to define that thing that it's missing, but you'll know that it's missing something. Um, and that goes for anything. Um, it's one of those things where it, no matter how you look at it, it takes time, but it's also the most worthwhile thing that we could do for ourselves, for the environment, for our families and for everyone around us. Like it's the doing things that help us to be the best version of ourselves possible is the only way that we can most effectively serve anyone around us or the world around us. If that isn't our first priority, then we're only giving 
our loved ones and we're only giving the world a fraction of what could be. Okay. So you already mentioned also the benefits of chocolate to some degree. So what are the main benefits before you said it's in a, in its own category. Um, how do we know what type of chocolate we should? You know, I have the feeling there's like different chocolates and there's different yes. parts of the chocolate and they're used for different things. So how can you, you know, to, to go back to this chocolate episode, how can you have yep. chocolate and what part of the chocolate and how to use it, and where to find so, it? So, um, I would start with making sure that people are using real well-sourced cacao. So look into the sourcing of the cacao. I'd say to recommend that people start by looking for craft chocolate. First and foremost, craft chocolate means that the people that are making it are doing it from bean to bar and they are concerned with the quality of the beans that they are getting. Now from there, choose how far into the intentionality spectrum you want to go. Um, for me, I do this 72 hour stone grind that uses no sheet. It's granite on granite. So I've got these big granite wheels that stone grind it. And that 72 hour stone grind means that I'm not cooking it. I'm not losing any of the nutrients that are in the cacao. I'm not losing any of the nutrients that are in the ingredients. And I'm able to create this, this chocolate bar that contains all the nutrients. So here's kind of the brilliance. I'm going to go into why mandala chocolate is exactly what, what is so sophisticated, advanced, and different about mandala chocolate. Besides, you know, the, the sourcing and the environment. So the chocolate itself, the process that we use to make the chocolate. So we're taking all of these superfoods, these ingredients, and a lot of superfoods don't work well together. They have ingredients that conflict. You need to find things that complement each other. Like physiologically, the way they function complement each other. And so a lot of science and understanding of chemical makeup and and nature of these superfoods goes into the blending of these things. Um, it's really easy. A lot of people just throw a bunch of superfoods in something and they actually are getting a lot of nutrient, anti-nutrient reactions where mm. you, have cert you have certain foods that inhibit enzyme action and then other foods where you need that enzyme action in order to properly digest them. So you're getting a lot of that in a lot of these like just mash it all together like i like this thing and i like that thing i'm gonna <laughs> put them all together that doesn't work so you have to formulate things understanding how the body is going to utilize these nutrients so that they're working together so that is a huge part of the formulation process so here we go i've got this cacao i've got these superfoods and i am putting them all together in this stone grinder and his stone grinder is granite on granite granite wheels on a granite plate surrounded by stainless steel slowly grinding and these this granite wheel can get particle size to 10 microns or less so i am breaking everything down to particle size that makes it the most bioavailable that it can possibly be so you're getting all of the nutrients their most bioavailable form. But what happens when you generally break down nutrients to their smallest, most bioavailable form is you also make them way more susceptible to degradation. Oxygen and things like that, you know, they, they slowly start to degrade. So this is where chocolate is the next step of why it's so brilliant as a nutrient delivery mechanism is while I'm grinding it, I'm emulsifying all of the cacao butter, the cacao fat, cacao solid and I'm emulsifying all of these broken down herbs into the cacao pots. I'm getting it all evenly mixed, all very homogenous. And then comes the tempering process. You take it out of the grinder 
and you take it into the tempering process. Tempering is how you get that chocolate bar that's got that shine, that snap. Uh, everything stays together. It's and never had a chocolate bar melt, resolidify. You've seen when it gets out of temper, it blooms. All the fats bloom, the sugars bloom, everything separates. It looks all marbly and gnarly when you eat it. It's chalky. It doesn't have that smoothness of texture anymore. Oh, yeah, it's like this. Yeah, smooshy thing. In your it's mouth. out of temper, and it and melts in your hands too. So it doesn't have that structural stability. When you're tempering chocolate, what you're doing is you're actually seeding a crystal. So you're seeding a crystalline structure. Cacao has six different crystalline structures that it can take, and only two of them have that stability that you would expect that allows it to stay in a bar form at room temperature and not just melt. Uh, and only one of them is the one that you associate with a store-bought tempered chocolate bar. And the way that this works is if the process of, of heating up the chocolate mass to a point where you eliminate all of the crystals, then you add some pre, you add some of this, the chocolate that's actually tempered, not that crystal. As you lower the temperature, you keep it moving. And that chocolate that is already crystallized will actually start attracting the molecules. It'll start building on the crystalline structure. It'll start organizing itself. And you lower the temperature, lower the temperature, and you get it down to a point where you're left with two crystals. You've got two of them formed. Then you raise the temperature just a little bit to get rid of that other crystal. And you're left with that tempered crystal, the one that you want. Then you pour that into mold. Now, what's cool about this is we're creating this crystalline lattice structure around all of those superfoods. So I've just broken down everything to its most bioavailable, easy to absorb particle size. And now I've just suspended all of those nutrients in this perfect fat container where no degradation can happen. Every single one of those nutrients is completely preserved and in its maximum nutritional state, which is awesome. And then, and then, so you have this, like, it's like the best suspension system for nutrition that exists because I'm literally grinding everything. I'm, I'm activating all of the superfoods in the chocolate. And it never has a chance for any degradation, just automatically suspends it into the bars. So then you eat the bar, all right? You eat a piece of this chocolate. That's where the theobromide comes back into the mix that I was talking about earlier, which theobroma, cacao is the name of the plant, means food of the gods. Theobromine is the chemical that most people mistake for caffeine. And like I said earlier, caffeine, when you drink coffee, it actually reduces your blood flow. It reduces your circulation. It constricts your veins and your capillaries. So it makes it harder for blood to flow. Theobromine, the biggest difference is it is a vasodilator. So if people say chocolate's a heart opener, it physiologically is a heart opener. It opens up all the blood vessels, allows blood to flow way more easily, um, which does a few different things. It allows more oxygen. It allows more nutrients, and it also allows your body to detoxify more easily. So it literally gets your whole body systems moving and functioning way more optimally. So imagine you take this little square and pick of, of a mandala chocolate bar, and you put it in your mouth. It opens up immediately because it's like caffeine. It reaches the blood-brain barrier like caffeine does. So it rapidly opens up all of the blood vessels in your mouth. And we've just broken down all of those particles to the smallest particle size of all the superfoods. So they're immediately available to the bloodstream where they're immediately able to be delivered to the body more quickly than ever before because of the theobromide. So you suddenly have a suspension and delivery mechanism that is sophisticated on so many levels in a way that nothing else is that I've ever seen. And there is no other person on the planet right now that I know of who is 
who is intentionally and actively uh, bringing all of these aspects of cacao and superfoods and how they can act as this advanced nutrient suspension and delivery mechanism together and really providing us to the world. And so really my biggest issue right now for my company is simply sharing what I just shared with you more succinctly. It's like when people see it on a shelf, they just see a fancy, healthy chocolate bar uh, with the higher price tag. They have no idea how deep it goes, how much science and alchemy and energy and sophisticated nutrient delivery technology is integrated into every single one of these chocolate bars. And that's why the chocolate is such an exciting thing for me because it is it is the embodiment of my mission. It is that cutting edge of nutritional technology um, while simultaneously bringing us back to our ancient roots of nutraceutical plants and mushrooms. Um, it's bridging the gap between all these different places in the world where these different superfoods come from. Uh, and it's celebrating the sustainability and health and wellness that we know is possible. It is literally one of the most holistically perfect offerings that I can bring into the world. And I hope that in this moment, you now understand even better the extent of what I'm actually doing here with this. Yeah, and I'm almost a bit sorry. I waited with this question to almost the end of the right? <laughs> because my wife informed me that the kids soon need to go to bed. But this is, I mean, I've heard so many times cacao is helping and, you know, opening up and all these things you explain. But for people like me, I was also like, when you have the cacao bean, so you have fats and all that stuff inside. And that's what makes the, the structure of it. Oh, it gets even better. Need, so I use a lot of adaptogens, adaptogenic like mushrooms and herbs, and cacao itself is an adaptogen. Cacao contains, and, and adaptogens basically are compounds that bind to or affect receptor points in our central nervous system and our endocrine system. And they create channels of communication between our body and our brain. So they, they help our body to then create the adrenal compounds we need in order to come into greater homeostatic equilibrium. So, um, so what's great about cacao is you look at the cacao butter is the raw material your body needs to produce the adrenal compounds. So you're taking all these adaptogens, the reishi and the chaga and the ashwagandha and the maca, all these adaptogenic herbs, that are telling your body, hey, we need to produce more of this or more of that, serotonin, dopamine, anandamide, whatever it is. And the rest of the cacao contains the raw materials your body needs to produce those adrenal compounds. It goes so deep. It's, it's basically, wild. basically, the doctors should sell your chocolate. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. Like, <laughs> I, I, and and the world should be treating chocolate as this awe-inspiring, unparalleled, cheerless, nutritional powerhouse that it is. We basically should have a shrine with your little figure as the Buddha, and then uh, with a chocolate bar in your hands, and celebrate it in the morning by meditating, eating a piece of your chocolate. That's I do that. I essentially do just that. Um, I go days in my life where I eat nothing but chocolate. I I used to do a lot of uh, oh, brain tracing. Chocolate yeah. and nuts is what I eat. I, I eat chocolate and nuts. But again, I have my lint and I try different organic chocolates. But for some reason, I haven't been stuck with any other one. So we'll have to see what we can do here. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to do a lot of uh, adventure racing, like these big, uh, mountain sport endurance races that last for like 36 hours, 72 hours. Oh, or all around the world or? Yes. And, and people are taking these triple cap gel shots. Well, every time you do that, you're literally getting this like massive vasoconstrictor. You're literally reducing your body's 
ability to pump blood into your extremities to detox and to deliver nutrients into your body. Like I want, I want the endurance world, the athlete world to know it's like, this is the way. Heal bromide, chakra, basal dilate, open up your dream. Like maximize your ability to automatically and easily and effectively absorb nutrients. You know, and because of that bioavailability of the nutrients, you're simultaneously not expending energy on digestion. You don't have to digest this stuff. You don't have to process this stuff. The amino acids are already in their basic form. You don't have to break down proteins to then rebuild protein. Your body is not expending energy and digestion, and it gets all of that net energy on top of the energy that you're already getting from the food. So it's this exponential um, energizing, enlivening, physiologically beneficial experience. And, And I think, you know, because we're addressing this at the end, I would love if at the beginning of another one, we just reiterated this. But as I said, you have opened so many doors with what you're talking that it's, it was a bit difficult for me to, to really choose. <laughs> but now, when I was young, and we have similar ages, we were told before you play a soccer game, before you go for a bike ride, right, like, Tour de France, right? They eat like a big plate of pasta because that's the energy source. I mean, carb loading. Yeah, yeah carb loading. And I've, I've heard on Tim Fer. I don't know if it was Tim Ferriss show or not. The one uh, talking about like uh, with some trainers, athletes, uh, marathon runners, and like yeah, they also did that. But many of their friends they died with heart attack, heart failure, and they all were <laughs> national races, right? For the national team, the World Olympics, and they were doing something healthy. And he also realized, like, when he did marathon, it was always a race. Every training was a race, and you were eating a lot of carbs. And you were not allowed to bodybuild. So he trains now his runners and bike runners on weightlifting uh, and not carb loading. So I say, like, in, in, in nutrition and in high performance athleticism, um, what is most important is, is staying away from inflammation. So inflammatory foods and maximizing oxygen and nutrient delivery to the body and bloodstream, minimizing the amount of energy expenditure in digestion. So when you're carb loading, yeah, you will be creating this net energy that you will be able to burn but high carb like pasta and things like that are very inflammatory so you're simultaneously creating this inflammation that will be you know it'll be treating some level of compromise to the level and degree of of effectiveness and efficiency that you're able to experience and so when you see these super high level athletes doing all this carb loading you just have to imagine what would happen if this person, uh, you know, then enacted a diet that, that actually is about more consistent micronutrient absorption, um, you know, things like theobromine and chocolate and superfood. And, and we're functioning from that perspective. I mean, it would be even more effective. Uh, they'd be even better at what they do. And more importantly, there would be much greater longevity in their ability to perform that way into the later years of their life. Because what happens with these, you know, hard loading diets and that level of performance is it that inflammation wears on the joints and wears on the connective tissues. It uh, essentially ages people. So, you know, you can only have you know, a number of effective years where you can implement that strategy successfully before your body starts to shut down. So it's like coming into this new strategy, uh, this new lifestyle strategy that is becoming way more popular in general. We see a lot more information on it where, uh, where, yeah, we're avoiding inflammatory foods, 
eating more simple whole foods and uh, paying more attention to micronutrients, bioavailability, and things of that nature. And you're seeing athletes who have implemented those strategies earlier in their lives able to perform at the top of their game for a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, I can see um, Djokovic, for example. He was strong. He was eating a lot of bread and pasta. Uh, Nutrition is struggling against what you feel. I'm from Basel, so actually have met him before he was really big. Um, and his nutrition changed how Djokovic is eating. And see, he's, he's really getting close to beat all the records what your favorite did. And that's already amazing what Watcher did. Yeah. And Djokovic is always like just behind. And then he changed how he's eating. Yeah, but he also does meditation, visualization, uh, you know, seeing himself winning the games and all that mental work. Um, I have not heard from Nadal or Roger Federer at that sport, and they are just a bit ahead doing the same. So I don't know what they do, but I know definitely Djokovic is doing meditation, visualization, food, and all these things. So let's see how all that. Going. And all of that is strengthening that vagal nerve connection between the mind and the body. It's giving you that extra control over your stress response so your body isn't flooding your system with adrenaline you're able to pulse norepinephrine way more effectively and efficiently. Your adrenals are more in equilibrium, which therefore means you're using all those fats and you're using all those micronutrients more effectively to produce the neuro the, the, the neurotransmitters and the hormones and the proteins and everything that you need for your body to function Optimally. So the meditation, like the Burton Wim Hof method kind of stuff, that's all a part of maximizing that body intelligence, increasing the bioavailability and the efficient use of whatever you're consuming. And when you then consume things that are inherently beneficial and supportive, you get this, it's once again, life by a thousand micrograms. You know, instead of death by a thousand cats, you get, you get this just exponential uptake in performance. I think I want to close down now for, for, for this episode. It's already two hours. Uh, I guess that's more than enough information for everyone to listen to. And as we already admit, we are going to continue <laughs> our, and I have two pages of questions already. So we will look at, uh, I'm sure I want to have an intake next time on, you know, sports, you know, preparations, mentally, food. Uh, we didn't talk about cacao ceremonies. I actually want to look into that. Uh, other meditations, we have all these kind of things. Yeah. Like I said, I want to, I would love to preempt a, a future discussion with all of the information that I shared about uh, what, like, the properties of Mandala Chakra and specifically the mission of that and where it works. And I think that we can lead into the cacao ceremonies and the sports, sports, nutraceutical experience and anything else like that from there. Yeah. And there's also, you know, the passage, the rites of passage we talked about in the first episode, but go perhaps a bit deeper into it because I think that's something which is, I don't know, I have the feeling. Some of our population is thinking about it and you hear here and there from people which did something because they wanted to do that because they have the feeling something is missing. So let's see. I mean, I'm sure we're going to have a few others to come, right? So I say thank you for the listeners and thank you, Rob, for today. And we are talking a bit after I close down here. and. See you next time, people. See you next time.